Once the flag fell, I went flat out. Obviously, every time I see a car that I'm caught up with, I really felt great about it, but I had no idea of the enormity of what it meant to myself, because it's really it's quite a thing to have on your CV as you won the Mealy Melia. Flying home to England after his great victory, Moss arrives at Lyd Airport. An eager British press is there to greet him, and so are a very proud mother and father. Oh, I'm certain in my greatest win. I can't think of any other car in the world that would have given me the opportunity of achieving the speeds we did. It was a very good car. The design was great. The, it was properly built. Mercedes put everything into it and behind it. You know, if you had a good car, you could determine really to what degree you take the risks. The 722 is a really strong car. I'm not just talking engine-wise, but suspension, all these things, and it was a very responsive car. When you're up 130, 140, 150 miles an hour, it's very good on the steering. The fact the car's really old, once it's about 60 years old, doesn't matter. That car, the way it is now, I reckon would beat any other cars anyway. This car is what a generation, my generation, look at as something, wow, man, that would be so cool to drive that car. That instinct that he had to adapt to the car that he was driving, and you could see it in his hands on the steering wheel, you could hear the throttle that he's controlling the rear end of the car. So Sterling really took that to a state of the art. I'm always excited to get in. She's so beautifully looked after by Mercedes, so I just get in, it started up and I drive. Mercedes up to the starting point with English ace Sterling Moss at the wheel of perhaps the greatest international road race of them all, the Mille Miglia. The first car went at 9 o'clock at night. At half minute intervals up until midnight, I went at 7.22 in the morning, hence the number, and I was not the last car. And now when you take five or six hundred Italians, you say, OK, you can now race on these roads, I have a horrible feeling that about 20 or 30 percent were competent to do that. Most of them, I'd say, were in the first 20 kilometers off the road burning. The Mille Miglia had this great Italian pathos. It was a big Italian road race, the biggest in the world really, a thousand miles down to Rome and up again, with the enthusiasm carried through the Italian spectators. Well, just the idea of driving a 150 mile, 200 mile an hour race car in public roads sort of stirs the imagination. It was a race that was it frightened me, it really did, because I, I knew how fast I had to go and how little I knew about where I was going. And I've managed to find a guy called Dennis Jenkinson. He was a motoring journalist. I said to him, look, I've got this Merck. They've asked me to do the Mealy Melia. Would you come with me? He said, oh, God, yes, that's it. We had a thing he made on this thing we called a toilet roll, and so he got this all written out. He gave me signals what would lay ahead if, as we came into a difficult position. Every corner that you come up to is a surprise. Yeah, you're trying to go fast, but at the same time, you don't want to go too fast, you might crash. When you're going along, remember, the road's closed, but they're not closed. They're only closed if people keep off them. I mean, everybody would be looking down the road like this, you know, and they gradually close up. So I had to wiggle the steering a bit so the car would move like that and people think, God, he's going to hit us, so we pull back. I mean, a lot of problems like that that you don't get on normal racing. He was not in the habit of making mistakes as a driver. He always attracted the crowds. He had a particular charisma about him all his life. to be in that sort of position, was going at the speeds we had to go, on cars with, by modern standards, not really good brakes and so on, was pretty scary.
There was a bridge we hit at probably doing 160 or so. And I tell you, when you hit a bridge at 160 more, you take off. And when you take off, that's pretty scary because there's nothing you can do. I mean, you, you're going to land where, where, the, where the thing lets you land. So you wait there like this and nothing happened. And I think that that was part of the mystique of that whole era. You just had to be super smart and be able to play that chess game better than anybody else. Finish first, you must first finish. And that's exactly the credo for this sort of race. So you had to drive it to win. I had a fairly good hope that I had, might have won because of the previous stop. Obviously, they were in telephone communication. But they said, you've got to wait because there were cars that had started behind me that might have caught up. I had a terrible anticlimactic, probably five or six minutes. I and mean, then once that was over, then I thought, that's it, I got it. At the finish, just over 10 hours later, it's Moss who crosses the line to win in record time. I find it very rewarding how nice it is to have people remind me of this. I mean, people say, I saw you go through Paddo, or I saw you go through this place, and I don't remember seeing them. I just went through. All of these road races like that were stopped because of spectator fatalities. Cars went into the crowds, it was inevitable. But the achievement of Sterling Moss to win that race in the way that he did, fantastic feat, and it's the one that Sterling quite rightly, is best known for. It is an event that, of course, will never, ever happen again, which means the record will stand. I mean, even today, so many years after, I think it's still a fairly impressive credential. Now, there was no way I could top it. But you know, so I did make other attempts, but I think I knew that it was unlikely to be beaten by any car, really. To get in there now and and drive it even down the road, and you realize, my God, this car really was a supercar. Only Mercedes could build a car like that.